But be turning in your Bibles to Psalm 105, verse 17 through verse 19. But before we get there, let me just share this with you. Your darkest hour is conquered by your dream about your future. A dream written down is a goal. A goal broken down into steps is a plan. A plan backed up by divine action will conquer your darkest hour. And I want to say this to everybody in this room. Listen to me. You will have a darkest hour. If you live very long upon this earth, you will have a darkest hour. And you will be the person responsible for making it either your permanent address or a temporary experience. Some people go through their darkest hour, their darkest moment in life, and they just get stuck there and they accept that that's the way things are going to be for the rest of my life. That is only by your choice. It is not by the will of God. Amen? Psalm 105, verse 17 through verse 19, New King James said it like this. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons. Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. To say that again until the time that his word came to pass till God's word came to pass the word of the Lord tested him I want to share with you this morning on this thought from your darkest hour to your brightest day Father I ask you now that your anointing would rest upon the remainder of this service that your will, purpose, and desire would be fulfilled in this room. God, you knew who would come into this house. You knew why they would be here. And Father, I believe that we're each one here by divine purpose. So I pray that your word will speak to us and it will come alive in us. And Lord, that it will literally change us in your presence today. In Christ's name. Amen. Turn around and look at your neighbor and say, you sure look beautiful today. You ladies told these men they look beautiful. They look handsome. Amen. Going back to the scripture that I read earlier to you, I want to take you to that part where it said the word of the Lord tested him. The word of the Lord tested him. Every one of us in this room have gone through dark hours. We've gone through dark moments. And here's the reality. Some of you listening to me in this room and some of you watching us online, you are in those dark moments right now. You're walking through places you don't understand and a lot of things are happening that's causing all kind of whirlwinds in your thoughts and in your mind and your heart and your spirit. And you sometimes you feel like it's so dark you can't see the light and you don't know what to do and you don't know where to turn. Well, let me just stop and tell you, it doesn't mean that you have sinned because you're going through a dark hour. It doesn't mean that you've abandoned God because you're going through a dark hour. It doesn't mean you've turned your back upon the Lord, and it doesn't mean God has turned His back upon you just because you're going through a dark hour. We all face those moments. We can walk in with the biggest smile upon our face and act like everything's great, grand, and wonderful in our life when deep down inside all hell is breaking loose inside of us emotionally, physically, spiritually, and even in our physical life. It's called dark moments. It's called dark times. But I want to share with you today some things that you need to remember when you're going through dark moments. 
Things you need to understand when you're going through those difficult times. Number one is this. Are you listening? Champions are never chosen from the ranks of unscarred people. I want to read that to you again and state it again. Champions are never chosen from the ranks of unscarred people. Every person God ever used in the Bible, he had put them through a blast furnace to see if they would be true and loyal to him. He allowed them to walk through places to find out what they were really made out of. And sometimes in your darkest hour, and I've said it many times and I'll say it again, I do not believe God puts bad things on good people. But I do believe that God allows us to walk through places in our life because in those times, He wants to build our character. He wants to build our strength and build our faith and build our boldness and bring us into the place that we can walk in Him. Even when we're facing hell itself, we can be strong enough to stay, excuse me, to stand and not run. Amen? Joseph died with scars around his ankles created by the irons placed upon his legs. He became the prime minister of Egypt wearing scars around his legs. Jesus was laid in a borrowed grave with scars of 39 stripes on his back with his hands and feet split open. He had a side ripped open with a Roman spear and a sure, and, and in his day, listen to me, he was totally destroyed physically in his death. But can I tell you, as I'm talking to you today, Jesus stands right now, or sits right now, should I say, at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and me, and He's sitting in the place as King of kings and Lord of lords. But I want to tell you, there are scars in His hands and scars in His feet. Now, He is God. He is part of God. He is the Son of God, but He's part of the Godhead. And it could have very easily been that when God raised Him up from the dead, that God could have removed the scars from His hands. God could have removed the scars from His feet. But God allowed those to stay there. You want me to tell you why? Because when we see Him one day, David, and we look Him face to face, we're going to be able to look into the hands. Oh, God, I feel Him. We're going to be able to look into the feet and understand the price he paid for our life. But what I want you to get, and I want you to understand, those scars came from darkened times. They came from darkened moments. And we're all going to carry scars that we will face in our dark times. But let me go back to that word scars for a minute. How are the Jewish people in the future going to recognize Jesus as the Messiah? Zechariah 12 and 10 said it like this. Then they, talking about the Jewish people, will look upon me whom they have pierced and know that he is the Son of God, the Messiah. How are they going to know it's him? They're going to see the scars. How are they going to recognize it's him? They're going to see the scars. Amen? But let me tell you how scars often come in your life. Yes, it's those dark moments, but how does it come? It comes through troubles and it comes through trials. It comes through difficult moments. And can I just tell you, troubles and difficulties will come into your life. I don't want to put a bad note on you. I don't want to put a depressing thought on you, but it will come to your life. I said this not long ago, but I want to restate it to you again today. Trouble does not mean God does not love you. Trouble means you are a card-carrying member of the human race. Trouble strengthens you. It puts fire in your body. Trouble tests your fortitude factor. Trouble will turn your spaghetti spine into a spine of steel. Amen? Trouble will make you stronger. Trouble reminds you that you are mortal. Trouble lets you know that your strength is not enough. Trouble forces you to call on God. Some people will never call on God till something bad comes their way, and then they want Him. 
Some people will never call upon the name of the Lord until something goes adverse, and then they want God. But then when everything gets worked out, everything's great, grand, and wonderful, they forget all about Him till the next problem comes. Amen? 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 Well, I want you to get it. But understand, when trouble comes your way, that's when you are to call on the Lord. Why? He is Jehovah Shammah. He is the God who is there. He will always be there, and all you have to do is call upon Him. In your darkest hour, the light of the world is with you. Amen? When you feel totally forgotten, the still small voice of God will whisper into your spirit, I will never leave you nor forsake you even to the ends of the earth. I'll never turn my back upon you. I'll never walk away from you, but I'll be with you all the way to the end of the world. Understand something today. You may be walking through a dark moment even as I speak, but can I declare to you, God is on your right side. God is on your left side. God is in front of you. God is behind you. He's all around you. He's above you, beneath you. God is with you. Oh, you ought to give the Lord a hand on that one. You ought to be excited about that one. Though your mother forgets you, though your father forgets you, though your so-called dearest friends forget you, God is saying, I'll never forsake you. God is saying, I'll never turn my back upon you. God is saying, I'll never look away from you. He's saying, I'm your defender. I'm your fortress. I'm your hope. I'm the light of the world. Turn to me, and I will save you. All God is looking for is for men, women, boys, and girls to turn to him. Just turn to him. I heard Greg said in the offering, it's obedience is what God's looking for. He just wants you to turn to Him and obey Him. Amen? The Bible says, and listen, He is the Lord that dwells in the thick darkness. I want you to hear this. Maybe you've never caught that scripture before. He is the Lord that dwells in the thick darkness. He is there in your darkest day. He is there in your darkest moment. While you are weeping in the cell about your predicament, God has Pharaoh preparing your signet ring. He's preparing your robe. He's getting you ready to wear royal robes. He's getting your chariot ready, your crown ready, your golden medallion ready. That will go around your neck. He's signifying to the people of the Egyptian empire that you are powerful. What I'm trying to tell you is, is God is getting you ready and signifying to every demon of hell that you are his child and that you are powerful and that his anointing, his authority, his might rest on you and in you. And if we would just learn to operate in what God's given us and we would just learn to operate in who we are in the Lord, how different things would be in our life. The Bible says, the hap has not entered into the minds of men what God has prepared for his own. It hasn't even entered into our thought processes all the things that God has prepared for us. But my thought is this today. God, I may not know it all. I may not think it all. I may not understand it all. But God, dump it all out on me. Amen? God, dump it all out on me. Because I want everything you have on your worst day in your life. Listen to these words in Jeremiah 33. Call upon me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not. You know what the Lord's saying? You may be going through the worst day of your life. Call on me. And I like what he said. Don't just call on me. I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things. Let me tell you why God don't show up many times in your situation. Because you don't call on him. God's not going to show up where he's not welcomed. God's not going to show up where you don't ask him. Amen? So if you don't ask him, you're just going to keep walking through that valley alone. If you don't ask him, you're just going to keep walking through that trial alone. If you don't ask him, you're going to keep walking through that dark place alone. But if you ask him, can I just stop and tell you, he'll come into where you are and the light of God will shine upon the darkness of your life and change everything about your circumstance. 
Then in your darkest day, you will call and the Lord will answer. Listen in Psalm chapter 50 when it said, Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. That's not my word, that's his word. The Bible says over and over and over, in your darkest day, the light of the world is right there. So the first thing we understood was champions do not come from unscarred people. The second thing I want you to notice in your darkest day is this. When you are in prison, remember the prison in the prison experience that adversity leads to achievement. I want that to sink in. Adversity leads to achievement. Your struggle is proof you have not been conquered. I want you to hear that. If you're struggling with something right now, it means the devil has not conquered you yet. If you are struggling in your spiritual battle and in your walk with God and the things that are going on and you're still trying to find your way and you're still trying to find certain things about your life and you're still trying to find out about your future and you're still trying to find out about where you're going and you're struggling, can I just stop and tell you the struggle may seem hard and the struggle may seem difficult, but I want to say it again. If you're struggling, it means the devil has not conquered you. Life has not conquered you. Circumstances have not conquered you but you're still moving forward in the name of the Lord. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Adversity leads to achievement. A mighty oak tree becomes a mighty oak tree. Why? Because a small seed is planted in the ground and it struggles through the dirt and the soil and it struggles till it comes forth and the sunlight shines upon it and the rain falls upon it and then over a amount of years it becomes a great and mighty tree but it started with a seed. It started with adversity. It started with something fighting against it. And let me say again, adversity leads to achievement. The resistance of water makes it possible for a battleship to float. Think about that one. The resistance of gravity makes it possible for you to walk around on your two feet. The resistance of air makes it possible for a jet aircraft to fly. But there's one word in all three of those, it's resistance. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't just come. It's resistance. Listen, Moses was listed as the public enemy number one in Egypt before God sent him thundering back to Pharaoh's court saying, let my people go. He's already public enemy number one. But God sent him back and said, let my people go. But here's what I want you to understand about Moses. So often we look at him and we think about what a mighty man he was, what a powerful man he was. But can I tell you this? One man called of God crushed the Egyptian empire. But when not long before that, he was herding sheep 40 years over in the backside of nowhere. So for 40 years, it seemed like his life was going nowhere. For 40 years, it seemed like he was accomplishing nothing. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, by the calling of God, he becomes a powerhouse. He becomes an anointed man of God that changes history. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? In one day of time, God can change everything. Amen? Amen? And I want to tell somebody in this room, don't look at your present circumstance and say, this is the final outcome for my life. Some of you are living in places right now and you feel like this is it. This is the end of the road. This is all it's ever going to be. But God sent me by to tell you that God's got more for your life. This is not it. It is not over. You're just in a season of time. You're in a season that you're walking through. But let me say it again. In one day of time, God can put you in a position of absolute power and authority to achieve the impossible that can happen. I said, that can happen just one day. You may feel like right now in this moment of your life, nothing's ever going to change. But can I tell you, when the sun comes up in the morning, Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. Listen, the disciples were on the sea, and there was a storm brewing. You know the story. The waves are pounding in against their boat, and they're in fear. And all of a sudden, they look up and they see someone coming, and they think it's a ghost, but they realize it's Jesus walking on the water. What does that have to do with us today? Let me listen to me right here. 
He was walking on what they were being threatened by. He was walking on what they were being threatened by and he was using it as a sidewalk to deliver them from where they were. So God sent me by to ask you, what is it that threatens to destroy you? What is it this morning that's threatening to destroy your life? Can I tell you, God has it under his feet. What you're fretting about, what you're sweating over, what you're struggling with, what you what you just don't seem like is ever going to come to an end. Can I say this? God is using it as a sidewalk to come out to where you are to rescue you from what's happening in your life. And I'm going to remind you of something we already know. Nothing is impossible with God. There's nothing about your life God cannot change. I said there's nothing about your life God cannot change. Nothing about you God cannot change. When you're in your darkest hour, God turns your trial into triumph. He transformed your misfortune into a masterpiece. will not you listen to something here? Joseph became prime minister through what appeared to be misfortune. If he had not been sold into slavery, he would have never met Potiphar. Hear this. He would have not been introduced to Potiphar's lustful wife, which got him thrown into prison. But in prison is where he met the cupbearer who told Pharaoh that this Jewish boy over in the jail could interpret dreams. And he, Joseph, was snatched from the prison and put into the palace in one day by the leader of the world. Why? Because he had the ability to interpret a dream. So in one day, he's in the lowest place of his life. And in the next day, he's in the highest place of his life. His whole world changed. His life seemed to be a series of tragedies, but it was in fact divinely orchestrated and masterpieced by the hand of God to do what? To save the world. I want to give you something. I want you to think about this. Joseph would save his family, Jacob. Jacob would be the source of Israel. Israel would be the source of the 12 tribes. King David, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who redeemed us all. But did you notice where it started? It started with Joseph. And I'm going to give you something maybe you never thought about before. The Bible would have never been printed if God had not gotten this little Jewish boy out of his shepherding family. All the way into Egypt and in the most powerful position in the world. Are you hearing me? Joseph's life looked like a series of tragedies, but in reality, it was nothing but a bus ticket to the perfect will of God. God brought him from his darkest tower to the brightest day of his life. And I want somebody in this room to understand and hear God's voice in this house today. You may feel like you're at the rock bottom. You may feel like you're at the emptiest place you've ever been in. But can I tell you, in a 24-hour period of time, everything can transform. But it doesn't have to be 24 hours. It can be a split second in your life. God can take you from your darkness into the greatest moments you've ever experienced. But I want to give you something before I close. When you're living in the darkest day of your life, there's three raging emotions you're going to deal with and you're going to face. And I want to approach them for a moment. Number one, you're going to deal with doubt. In your dark hours, in your dark moments of life, you're going to deal with doubt. Please hear me out. Joseph, ask as you will ask, am I in the will of God? Has anybody ever asked that question? Anybody ever asked the Lord that? Am I in the will of God? Why would we ask that? We look at our life and we say, well, look at my life. It's an absolute disaster. If God loves me, why is all this happening to me? If God loves me, why am I going through this? If God loves me, why is this going on? If God loves me, why isn't he answering me? And we ask ourselves, am I really in the will of God? But you know where all that started? With a word called doubt. And I'm going to rock some people's world right here. I didn't say disbelief. I said doubt. Doubt is not disbelief. I want to settle something right here in this room. I'm going to say that again. Doubt is not disbelief. The Greek word for doubt projects the concept of uncertainty or being unsettled in a matter. 
Disbelief refuses to consider the truth. Disbelief says there is no God. And some people believe that doubt and disbelief are the same thing, but they are not. And I'm just going to get real with you. There's not a Christian alive that hasn't sometime gone through a period or a place of doubt in their life. I don't care who you are. Amen? Amen? Is there any perfect person in this room? Raise your hand up. You all won't talk to you after church. There's not a one of us who has not ever gone through doubt. But let me just give you something here. Doubt says, disbelief says there's no God. Disbelief doesn't consider the truth. But doubt says if God is for us, why is this happening? You ever ask that question? But there's a great difference between doubt and disbelief. Listen, John the Baptist, who was the cousin of Jesus Christ, he was in prison. He's about to be beheaded. But he hears about what's going on with Jesus. He hears about what's happening with Jesus. He hears about the miracles that are going on. So he sends two of his disciples out. He said, I want you to go find out and ask Jesus, are you the one we should be looking for or should we look further? And here's what I want you to get. In that statement alone, there was a question of doubt. But let me tell you something about John. Jesus said, no greater man was born of woman than John. Well, what does that have to do with me, Pastor? If the greatest man who ever lived doubted on his darkest day, why are you doubting that God loves you? Amen? Amen? So if the greatest man that ever lived, as God looked upon him, if he had a moment of doubt, Why do you struggle with the fact that God loves you if you walk through a moment or a valley of doubt in your life? How do you deal with your doubts? You deal with your doubts by knowing you trust in God who is all-knowing and He is smarter than you. Amen? Listen to me. God sees the future. He can see. You can't see your future, but God knows all about you. He sees the end from the beginning. We call him the Alpha and the Omega, which is the beginning of the first and the last. He knows what's going on. He knows what's happening. He knows every detail of your life. And the Bible said in Isaiah 55, 8 and 10, New, New Living Translation, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You want to know what God was saying there? Let's just bring it down to where it's really at. God was saying there, I'm a lot smarter than you, so quit worrying. Amen? God was saying, I don't have to figure it out. I know what your future holds. So if you'll just put it in my hand, you don't have to worry. You don't have to fret. You don't have to be afraid. Just put it in my hand and let me guide you. Let me take you. Let me uphold you. But we struggle with putting our future in God's hand. We struggle with releasing everything to God. We struggle with turning it all over to the Lord. God is simply saying, if you'll trust me, if you'll believe me, and I want to assure somebody something in this room, God will never, ever, ever, ever let you down. People will let you down. The church might let you down. Amen? Society might let you down. But God will never, ever, 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 ever let you down. So let me ask you, where are you? Are you just floating around out here somewhere? Are you resting safely in the palm of the hand of God? Mm. God says when you're in your dark place, when you're in doubt, he said, trust me. Can I just tell you, doubt flourishes in the dark. Doubt is like a toxic mold that grows spiritual darkness, and darkness will feed your doubts. Let me tell you where the answer is. The answer is run to the light. I said, the answer is run to the light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So can I just stop and tell you, when you find yourself in those places, run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Run to the light of the Lord. Get in the Word of God. Get on your knees in prayer. Get your face in the place before God. 
The light conquers darkness. Light reveals. Light exposes. Light guides you to the cross. Light brings hope. Light brings the answer. And Jesus is the light. But can I tell you what James 1.17 said? It calls God the Father of lights. Satan is called the Prince of Darkness. But God is called the Father of lights. So let me ask you, when you are tired, when you're alone, when you're weary, when you're broken hearted, when your life makes no sense, which will you choose? Jesus or Satan? Now let me answer that for you. We would quickly say, I will choose Jesus, but do we? Think about it a moment. I would quickly choose Jesus, but do we? When you're living in your darkest moment in life, repeat these words. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength. Of whom shall I be afraid? And then once you've quoted that scripture, you feel the surge of God coming in and filling your life. And you know then that you cannot be defeated because God has you. You will prosper in Jesus' name. The second thing I want to point out, you listen to me. In your crisis, in that place of darkness in your life, you'll go through discouragement. I know what time it is, but stay with me. You'll go through discouragement. This is important. Discouragement can be translated as to faint or to grow weary. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul speaks to the pastors, to the worship team members, to the teachers, to the ushers, to the ministry staff who may have been discouraged in ministry. And he said this, Therefore, since we have this ministry, we have received mercy. We do not lose heart. That's what I want you to key on. We do not lose heart. Then Jesus said in Luke 18, that men are always to pray and not to faint or lose heart. He said, pray, don't faint. If you don't faint, you won't lose heart. This is important. We must live and breathe and take up the the residence of prayer in our life because we are sure to faint, we're sure to grow weary, be discouraged, and be bitter if we do not pray. And I'm going to tell you, the answer is get on your knees and fight the good fight of faith. Now I'm going to shift gears here for just a moment. Prayer is the key, amen? I'm going to give you something here. Prayer is warfare. A prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. You are only as strong in the Lord as you are in prayer. Amen? You pray now, lay me down to sleep prayers, you're going to have a now, lay me down to relationship with God. Amen? You get real in your prayer life, you get fervent in your prayer life, and you get down to busy in your prayer life, you're going to have a relationship with God like you ain't never had before. It's all in the choice. It's all in the decision. Some prayer, some power. More prayer, more power. Much prayer, much power. Prayer should be first choice and not our last choice, and we need to learn to get it right. Amen. We'll give you something right here. Did you know that prayerlessness is sin? Boy, it's really quiet in here now. Prayerlessness is sin. Prove it, Pastor, okay. 1 Samuel 12, 23, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. You want me to take it a little bit further? He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, under him is sin. Is prayer not good? I said, is prayer not good? Oh, God help us. Did you even know that verse was in the Bible? Did you even realize it was there? But can I tell you, as powerful is God, as God is, he cannot answer prayer until it is prayed. I said, as powerful as God is, he cannot answer prayer until it's prayed. Oh, God can do anything. I understand that. And the reason he won't answer those prayers unless they're prayed, because he chooses not to. You have not because you ask not. The New Testament church, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. What did that? The power of prayer. When they prayed, the house shook. When they prayed, the power of God came. When they prayed, the anointing of God rested upon them. When they prayed, powerful things began to happen. Listen to me. Joseph was thrown into the prison. 
He was put in the stocks. He was put in the buns. He went, and all of this brought discouragement up on his life. But here's something I want everybody in this room to hear me. He did not blame God. I said he did not blame God. God. And I want to say something very important right here. Too often, we're, if we're not careful, we blame God or we blame somebody else for what we're going through. I want to just stop and tell somebody in this room, stop blaming somebody else for what you're going through and take responsibility for your own actions. Go ahead and give him a hand. They didn't do it. You did it. Deal with it. That's straightforward, isn't it? We got to learn to take responsibility for our own action. But let me just tell you, when you blame God, you cut off the power source. When you blame others, you extend differences between you and them that will poison your relationships. This is important. The blame never affirms, it only assaults. The blame never solves the problem. It only complicates the problem. Blame does not unite. It separates. Blame never forgives. It rejects. When you get in trouble, stop blaming everybody else, including God, and give it to God, and God will fix it. But as long as you're blaming, as long as you're caring, as long as you're dealing with it in yourself, God can't turn it around. But the moment you give it to the Lord, He will change everything. The last enemy you will face is depression. The last thing you will face in that darkest hour is depression. It may not be the last thing, you, but it's the last thing I want to point out to you. You will deal with depression. I'm not talking about a psychotic depression. I'm talking about mood swings. I'm talking about disappointment. By definition, it means a negative state of mind that causes a change in your mood and in your behavior. Can I tell you, depression is the opposite of happy. We understand that. Depression covers everything from the blues to minor mood swings to something severe taking place. It covers a lot of territory. Almost everyone can get depressed from time to time. I dare say there's not a person in this room who has not walked in depression in some place or some phase in your life. The Bible said great men suffered with depression. The Bible declared that there were those that we look at as giants of the faith who struggled with depression. Moses was depressed. He was one of the greatest leaders, spiritual leaders in the history of the world. But he got depressed. Job got depressed and he cursed the day he was born. He said, why was I not born dead? Why did life even come to me? Why? He was depressed. Now let's look at Elijah. Man of anointing, authority, and power. He said, look at my life. I'm the only one left. In other words, he was saying, I'm the only one left. God will live for you. He's depressed. Pressed down, trodden down. Pity pot prayers lead to depression. Let me spell that for you. P-I-T-Y dash P-O-T. Pity pot prayers lead to depression. The only thing that will get you out is when you get real in prayer. I don't mean to be hard here and I don't mean to be ugly here and I, that's not my intent, but I want you to hear me. As long as you're walking around patting yourself on the shoulder saying, poor, poor, pitiful me, and feeling sorry for yourself where you are, all you're doing is letting the devil put his thumbnail on you and press you further down in that place of despair where you are. But when you make up your mind that I'm going to rise up from this pity party, I'm going to rise up from this place, and I'm going to get along with God, and I'm going to seek the face of the Lord, and I'm going to intercede until I feel the presence of God. If it takes me five minutes, if it takes me five days, if it takes me five weeks. Weeks, I'm going to hold on until God moves in me. 
Somebody hear this preacher today. You have to make that choice. King David said, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? You have to decide. Stand to your feet. I want to close it like this. Sometimes God will put something in your life that makes you suddenly come to life. Sometimes you may just be moseying along like you're just floating along. God will bring something in your life to wake you up. God will bring something in your life to get your attention. God will bring something in your life to make you aware again. Remember this. Adversity leads to achievement. Prison leads to the palace. And crucifixion leads to resurrection. But it all started with what? Adversity. But in adversity came achievement, came breakthrough, came deliverance, came victory. God sent me to tell somebody, God is taking you somewhere. If you are living in the darkest hour of your life, rejoice and be exceedingly glad in knowing that tomorrow starts the beginning of the brightest day of your life. But here's what I want to bring to you. Nobody can bring you from where you are to where God is. Nobody can make a decision for you to walk out of your valley. Nobody can make a decision for you, for you to lay it all aside and trust in the Lord. Nobody can do that. Because trust me, as the shepherd of this house and the shepherd of this flock, if I could do it, I would do it for everybody in this church, everybody in this town, everybody in this city, everybody in this county, everybody in it. I'd do it. But I can't do that. Only you. And I stress this because there's people all throughout this room. I'm talking to you right now. Only you can choose to come from where you are and see a total transformation in your life. This is going to sound simple. God wants to take you from the darkest hour to your brightest day. It's going to sound simple, but this is what I felt like the Lord wanted me to tell you. If you're walking in darkness, but you're ready to walk in the light, get out of your seat and come forward in the presence of God. 